Volume 1, Chapter 1 of Clayhanger by Arnold Bennett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evans. Clayhanger by Arnold Bennett. Volume 1, Chapter 1. 1. His Vacation. The Last of a Schoolboy. Edmund Clayhanger stood on the steep-sloping, red-bricked canal bridge in the valley between Bursley and its suburb, Hillport. In that neighbourhood, the Nipe and Mersey Canal formed the western boundary of the industrialism of the five towns. To the east rose pitheads, chimneys and kilns, tier after tier, dim in their own mists. To the west, Hillport fields, grimed but possessing authentic hedgerows and winding paths, mounted broadly up to the sharp ridge on which stood Hillport Church, a landmark. Beyond the ridge, and partly protected by it from the driving smoke of the five towns, lay the fine and ancient Tory borough of Oldcastle, from whose historic middle school Edwin Clayhanger was now walking home. The fine and ancient Tory borough provided education for the whole of the five towns, but the relentless ignorance of its prejudices had blighted the district. A hundred years earlier, the canal had only been obtained after a vicious parliamentary fight between industry and the fine and ancient borough, which saw in canals a menace to its importance as a centre of traffic. Fifty years earlier, the fine and ancient borough had succeeded in forcing the greatest railway line in England to run through unpopulated country five miles off, instead of through the five towns, because it loathed the mere conception of a railway. And now, People are inquiring why the Five Towns, with a railway system special to itself, is characterised by a perhaps excessive provincialism. These interesting details have everything to do with the history of Edwin Clayhanger, as they have everything to do with the history of each of the 200,000 souls of the Five Towns. Oldcastle guessed not the vast influences of its sublime stupidity. It was a breezy Friday in July 1872. The canal, which ran north and south, reflected a blue and white sky. Towards the bridge, from the north, came a long, narrow canal boat, roofed with tarpaulins. And towards the bridge from the south came a similar craft, sluggishly creeping. The towing path was a morass of sticky brown mud, for, in the way of rain, that year was breaking the record of a century and a half. Thirty yards in front of each boat, an unhappy skeleton of a horse floundered its best in the quagmire. The honest endeavour of one of the animals received a frequent tonic from a bare-legged girl of seven, who heartily curled a whip about its crooked, large-jointed legs. The ragged and filthy child danced in the rich mud around the horse's flanks with the simple joy of one who had been rewarded for good behaviour by the unrestricted use of a whip for the first time. Edwin, with his elbows on the stone parapet of the bridge, stared uninterested at the spectacle of the child, the whip and the skeleton. He was not insensible to the piquancy of the pageant of life, but his mind was preoccupied with grave and heavy matters. He had left school that day, and what his eyes saw as he leaned on the bridge was not a willing beast and a gladdened infant, but the puzzling world and the advance guard of its problems bearing down on him. Him, corky, untidy, fair, with his warm black braided clothes, and slung over his shoulders in a bursting satchel the last load of his schoolbooks, and on his bright rough hair a shapeless cap whose lining protruded behind. He had the extraordinary wistful look of innocence and simplicity which marks most boys of sixteen. It seemed rather a shame, it seemed even tragic, this naive, simple creature with his straightforward and friendly eyes so eager to believe appearances. This creature, immaculate of worldly experience, has soon be transformed into a man, wary, the prejudice, and attractor. Older eyes might have wept at the simplicity of those eyes. This picture of Edward as a wistful innocent would have made Edward laugh. He'd been seven years at school and considered himself a hardened sort of brute, free of illusions and he sometimes thought that he could judge the world better than most neighbouring mortals. Hello, the Sunday, he 
moment without turning his eyes. Another boy, a little younger and shorter and clothed in a superior untidiness, had somehow got onto the bridge and was leaning his back against the parapet which supported Edwin's elbow. His eyes were franker and simpler even than the eyes of Edwin, and his lips seemed to be permanently parted in a good-humoured smile. His name was Charlie Orgreave, but at school he was invariably called The Sunday. Not Sunday, but The Sunday. And nobody could authoritatively explain how he had come by the nickname. His origin was lost in the prehistoric ages of his childhood. He and Edward had been chums for several years. They had not sworn fearful oaths of loyalty. They did not constitute a secret society. They had not even pricked forearms and written certain words in blood. But these rites were only performed at Harrow, and possibly at the Old Castle High School, which imitates Harrow. Their fellowship meant chiefly that they spent a great deal of time together, instinctively and unconsciously enjoying each other's mere presence, and that in public arguments they have always reinforced each other, whatever the degree of intellectual dishonesty thereby necessitated. I bet you mind getting to the bridge first, said the Sunday. With an ingenious movement of the shoulders, he arranged himself so that the parapet should bear the weight of his satchel. Edward Clayhanger slowly turned round and perceived that the object which the Sunday had appropriated as his was the other canal boat advancing from the south. Horse or boat? Edwin asked. Boat's nose, of course, said the Sunday. Well, said Edwin, having surveyed the unconscious competitors and counting on the aid of the whipping child, I don't mind laying you five. That'd be damned for a tail, protested the Sunday. We say we never bet less than ten, you know that. Yes, but... Edwin hesitatingly drawled. But what? All right, ten, Edwin agreed. But it's not fair. You've got a rare start on me. Rats, said the Sunday with finality. In the pronunciation of this word, the difference between his accent and Edwin's came out clear. The Sunday's accent was less local. There was a hint of a short E sound in the A, and a briskness about the consonants. But Edward could never have compassed. The Sunday's accent was as carelessly superior as his clothes. Evidently, the Sunday had someone at home who had not learned the art of speech in the five times. 3. He began to outline a scheme in which perpendicular expectoration figured for accurately deciding the winner, and a complicated argument might have ensued about this it did not soon become apparent that Edwin's boat was going to be handsomely beaten, despite the joyous efforts of the little child. The horse that would die but would not give up was only saved from total subsidence at every step by his indomitable and aging spirit. Edwin handed over the ten marbles even before the other boat had arrived at the bridge. Here, he said, and you may well as add these two, adding five more to the ten, all he possessed. They were not the paltry marvel of today, plaything of infants, but the majestic Rinka, black with white spots, the king of marvels, in an era when whole populations practised the game. Edwin looked at them half regretfully as they lay in the Sunday's hands. They seemed prodigious wealth in those hands, and he felt somewhat as a condemned man might feel who bequeaths his jewels on the scaffold. Then there was a rattle, and a tumour grew out larger on the Sunday's thigh. The winning boat, long preceded by its horse, rolled under the bridge and passed northwards to the sea, laden with crates of earthenware. And then the loser, the little girl's father and mother and her brothers and sisters and her kitchen, drawing room and bedroom, and her smoking chimney and her memories and all that was hers in the stern of it, slid beneath the boy's downturned faces while the whip cracked away beyond the bridge. They could see between the whitened tarpaulins the deep belly of the craft was filled with clay. Where does that, that clay come from? asked Edwin. For not many was he honestly struck by a sudden new curiosity, but it was meet for him to behave like a man now and to ask manly questions. Run, call me, said the Sunday scornfully. Can't you see it painted all over the boat? Why do they bring clay all the way from Runcorn? They don't bring it from Runcorn, they bring it from Cornwall. Comes round by sea. See? Who told you? Edwin roughly demanded. Anybody knows that, said the Sunday grandly. 
but always maintaining his gay smile. Seems devilish funny to me, Edward murmured after reflection, that they should bring clay all that roundabout way just to make cocks of it here. Why should they choose just this place to make cocks in? I always understood. Oh, come on, the Sunday cut him short. It's blessed well at one o'clock and after. Four. They climbed the long bank from the canal up to the manor farm, at which high point their roads diverged, one path leading direct to Bleak Ridge, where Aldrey lived, and the other zigzagging down through an elective pasturage into Bursley proper. Usually they parted here without a word, taking pride in such Spartan taciturnity, and they would doubtless have done the same this morning also, though it were fiftyfold their last walk together as two schoolboys. But an incident intervened. Hold on, cried the Sunday. To the south of them, a mile and a half off, breathing mist of the Calden Bar ironworks, there was a yellow gleam that even the capricious sunlight could not kill. And then two rivers of fire sprang from the gleam and ran in a thousand delicate and lovely hues down the side of a mountain of refuse. They were emptying a few tons of molten slag at the Calden Bar ironworks. The two rivers hung slowly dying in the mists of smoke. They reddened and faded, and you thought they had vanished, and you could see them yet. And then they escaped the baffled eye, unless a cloud aided them for a moment against the sun, and their ephemeral but enchanting beauty had expired for ever. Now, said Edward sharply. One minute, ten seconds, said the Sunday, who snatched out his watch, and the inestimable contrivance with the centre second's hand. By Jove, that was a good one. A moment later, Two smaller boys, both laden with satchels, appeared over the brow from the canal. Let's wait a jiff, said the Sunday to Ebbing. And as the smaller boys showed no hurry, he bawled out to them across the intervening cinder waste. Run! They ran. They were his younger brothers, Johnny and Jimmy. Take this and hook it, he commanded, passing the strap of his satchel over his head as they came up. In fatalistic silence, they obeyed the smiling tyrant. What are you going to do? Edwin asked. I'm coming down your way a bit. But I thought you said you were pecking. I shall eat three slices of beef instead of my usual brace, said the Sunday cast. Edwin was touched, and the Sunday was touched because he knew he had touched Edwin. After all, this was a solemn occasion, but neither would overtly admit that its solemnity had affected him. Hence, first one, and then the other, began to skim stones with vicious force over the surface of the largest of the three ponds that gave interest to the manor farm. When they had thus proved to themselves that the day differed in no manner from any other breaking up day, they went forward. On their left were two pitheads whose double wheels revolved rapidly in smooth silence, and the puffing engine house and all the trucks and gear of a large ironstone mine. On their right was the astonishing farm, with barns and ricks and cornfields complete, seemingly quite unaware of its forlorn oddness in that foul arena of manufacture. In front, on a little hill in the vast valley, was spread out the Indian red architecture of Bursley. Tall chimneys and rounded ovens, schools, the new scarlet market, the grey tower of the old church, the high spire of the evangelical church, the low spire of the church of genuflections, and the crimson chapels, and rows of little red houses with amber chimney pots, and the gold angel of the blackened town hall topping the whole. The sedate reddish browns and reds of the composition, all netted in flowing scarves of smoke, harmonised exquisitely with the chill blues of the chequered sky. Beauty was achieved, and none saw it. The boys descended without a word through the brick strewn pastures, where a horse or two cropped the short grass. At the railway bridge, which carried a branch mineral line over the path, they exchanged a brief volley of words with the working lads who always played pitch and toss there in the dinner hour. And the Sunday added to the collection of shawls and stones lodged on the other ledges of the low iron girders. A strange boy, he had sworn to put ten thousand stones on those ledges before he died or perish in the attempt. Hence, Edwin sometimes called him, Old Perish in the Attempt. A little farther on, 
the open gates of a manufactory disclosed six men playing the noble game of wrinkles on a smooth patch of ground near the weighing machine. These six men were Messieurs Ford, Carter and Udall, the three partners owning the works, and three of their employees. They were celebrated marble players, and the boys stayed to watch them, as, bending with one knee almost touching the earth, they shot the wrinkles from their stubby thumbs with a cannon-like force of precision that no boy could ever hope to equal. My God, mumbled Edward involuntarily, when an impossible shot was accomplished. And the bearded shooter, pleased by this tribute from youth, twisted his white apron into a still narrower ring round his waist. Yet Edwin was not thinking about the game. He was thinking about the battle that lay before him, and how he would be weakened in the fight by the fact that in the last school examination, Charlie Orgreave, younger than himself by a year, ousted him from the second place in the school. The report in his pocket said, Position in class next term, third, whereas he had been second since the beginning of the year. There would of course be no next term for him. But the report remained. A youth who had come to grips with that powerful enemy, his father, cannot afford to be handicapped by even such a trifle as a report entirely irrelevant to the struggle. Suddenly, Charlie Orgreave gave a curt nod and departed in nonchalant good humour, doubtless considering that to accompany his chum any farther would be to be guilty of girlish sentimentality. And Edwin nodded with equal curtness and made off slowly into the maze of Bursley. The thought in his heart was, I'm on my own now, I've got to face it now by myself. And he felt that not merely his father, but the League universe was against him. End of Volume 1, Chapter 1